Wonderful to see you, Shalom Aleichem. Wonderful to see you all here this afternoon. My name is Miri Carl, and I'm the um, director of the California Institute for Yiddish Culture and Language, which has been bringing you all kinds of Yiddish cultural events uh, since uh, 2000. Amazing, huh? It's um, almost 20 years. So uh, it's really a pleasure that we have wonderful uh, loyalists who are here with us today and, and, and some new faces. So it's great to see you all, so welcome. We have really a terrific program today. Before, before my formal introduction, I want to, uh, sorry, you know, before I say something, I wanna say a few words. Um, <laughs> Uh, I want to first just thank those who helped out today, uh, in particular Joyce Tamara, uh, and, yes, and, then, and then the those who were uh, schlepped into it as uh, Freiwillige, which is volunteers. Uh, so Robin Evans and Jim Evans, and we'll be thanked for other things later. But thank you so much for that. Uh, and uh, Gustavo Bugac, who ran up here to take care of this, who many of you know as this extraordinary musician and the head of, uh, of a Klezmer band called Klezmer Juice. We've collaborated a lot together in the past. And now and then he helps <coughs> us out with uh, audio. So thank you so much to Gustavo as well. Uh, and I'm delighted to see some of my UCLA students here today present and past, which is really amazing, yeah? So uh, it's, um, uh, you're, you're in for something great. And of course, we want to thank the Santa Monica Synagogue, uh, who is our eternal co-sponsor. I mean, it's really quite a gift that they give us of this space. Uh, and that's Rabbi Jeff Marks. And I don't know, is anyone here from the synagogue? Occasionally, some of the members show up um, but I guess not today. Well, hopefully the word will drift back that we appreciate it so much. Um, I also want to remind you all that we have an event coming up on January 5th, and that is a um, basically about how a trove of Yiddish letters led to a journey of discovery and uh, a memoir, and it's with David Slutsky, who comes to us on his way back home to Melbourne, Australia. So it's really a, an amazing thing that we're able to rope him in to give us a talk uh, about um, his family and his discoveries, which is really all about also the civilization that existed in Poland um, before the war. And we have an opportunity <coughs> to collaborate with Yid Life Crisis. Anyone know? Some of you know Yid Life Crisis pretty well. Yeah, uh, so there might be something happening with them in February. Uh, but we also are looking for underwriters for that event because it's not, it uh, uh, takes quite a lot to put on. So keep that in mind uh, when you're getting to the end of the year. I first met Scott Davis and his sister more than 15 years ago. And it was in the home of a mutual friend of ours, Savelle Bender, Oliver Shalom, who uh, passed away at the age of 92 just a couple of months ago. She was a force of nature, those of you who knew her, and an expert in Yiddish theater. And she loved to bring people together uh, if she felt that they would enjoy meeting each other, uh, if she felt that it would somehow further her passion, which was really for Yiddish. And um, I've met many, many exceptional people through Yiddish. And some of you have become dear friends. Some who are in this room today have become dear friends. And so aside from the enrichment of my own personal life, I can't help continuously be astonished by the unimaginable scope of Yiddish culture 
and by extension, Jewish culture and history. Because it always happens that when one encounters a Yiddish poem or a song or a play like Fiddler on Broadway now, or a story or a film, even in translation, if your curiosity prods you even a skosh to look a bit deeper, you immediately discover that behind that poem or song or play or story or film is some unexpected story or history. And if you follow that thread just a bit more, you keep discovering things that will amaze you, bring you to tears, or tickle your joy. I often refer to a statement by Aaron Lansky, whom you might know as the founder of the Yiddish Book Center in Amherst. He said, when I first met him, uh, I was leaving, it was 1993, uh, that discovering Yiddish is like discovering the lost continent of Atlantis. <laughs> For indeed, the civilization that flourished in just my parents' lifetimes was lost beneath the unspeakable tragedy that today we call the Shoah, in English from the Hebrew, the great destruction in Yiddish. And it was also buried by the Soviet Union's repressions and the serious efforts of one of my beloved countries, Israel, to unify its citizens under one resurrected language, Hebrew, and in the process, attempt to is extinguish the language of European Jewry. And of course, it's buried through sheer neglect and forgetfulness. So here today, we have an amazing individual that I'm about to introduce, who stumbled upon a name, a work, uh, and followed the thread wherever it led him. <clears throat> to satisfy his own curiosity and yearning, yes, but ultimately to enrich all of us to come and those who come after us by reclaiming the mysteriously forgotten author who once outshone everyone whose names are more widely known today. And what our special guest brings to light most of all is that the turn of the 20th century when this mysterious author was at the height of his popularity he was just one of a cadre of talented individuals who were so excited at the prospect of bringing forth their creativity in the unique and uniquely expressive language of their people. They helped to bring about a literature that rivals any world literature in its wisdom, humor, artistry, and it is what we all benefit from today directly and indirectly. So Scott Davis, he's a long, a lifelong storyteller with a 35 year career as a producer of documentaries and dramas for public television. His many awards include seven Emmys. Whoa. <laughs> In this town that means something, right? <laughs> In 2007, Scott founded Jewish Storyteller Press to bring the works of 19th century Jewish writers to 21st century readers. He himself is the author of Souls Are Flying, a celebration of Jewish stories between heaven and earth, four one-act plays on the tales of Yudlamid Peretz, and his current passion coming to an end, <sighs> is to recover the works of Jacob Dinesen and make them available to a new generation of readers. <clears throat> but what is interesting is that this work has also been a family effort involving his sister Robin and her husband Jim Evans, who have supported the effort every step of the way. 
He currently resides in North Carolina, although he's a native Angelino. And he's taking a brief <coughs> hiatus after this 16 year obsession with Jacob Dennison before embarking on a new creative endeavor. So we're happy to have him here today, kind of the culmination of that long odyssey in a way, right? So I'm so happy to, to welcome Scott Davis. <laughs> and I just want to mention that at the very end, um, we're going to have a little sample of Jacob Dennison's writings in uh, from one, one of his works uh, in Yiddish and in English translation. And then we'll have a little reception afterwards. So I hope you all stay for that. Not to mention a Q&A, which I know you all have plenty of. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. It's, uh, this is such a pleasure to be here, and I've got, got to get to my notes. But uh, I was in public television for many, many years, and there was always someone, you know, like Gustavo, who would come up and make sure everything was tight and in the right place. So, um, you know, I, first, I really do want to thank you all for being here this afternoon and being a part of this. And Miri Coral has been the most amazing friend and inspiration along the way. She's also been one of our major translators for the projects that we've been working on. You can see behind me all of the Yiddish books that Dinazan wrote along the way, also all the postcards. It's so amazing how much information there was about him out in the world, but no one really knew about it, no one really saw it, and a lot of these things actually came from eBay. They would show up on eBay, and all of a sudden, you know, for $6, I could have a postcard of Jacob Dinazan. In fact, you'll see later on a picture of Dinazan and Sholem Aleichem sitting side by side. It came from a collection of photographs on eBay of all things. So anyway, I hope you have some surprises as you learn about this remarkable 19th century Yiddish author named Jacob Dinazan. Miri has called Jacob Dinazan my obsession, more like my Meshugana <laughs> obsession. And it's true, because this once beloved and nearly forgotten Jewish writer has taken me on an 18-year personal journey into the vibrant, creative, complicated world of modern Yiddish literature. And it's a journey that began by accident and ultimately ended up in a Jewish cemetery in Warsaw, Poland this past August where my family and I participated in the celebration of Jacob Dinazan's 100th, 100th Yortzeit, the 100th anniversary of his death. Now, as, as Mary mentioned, I must tell you that this is an especially poignant moment for me, because about five years ago, when I was able to do a talk uh, at the book launch of, uh, of the book Memories and Scenes, Dinazan's Memories and Scenes, Shtetl Childhood Writers, I was introduced by my beloved Los Angeles Mittelschul teacher and lifelong mentor, Sibel Bender of Blessed Memory, who as many of you know, and as Miri said, passed away just a little over two months ago. You know, Miri, I mean, as, uh, Sibel was, my, was not only my teacher, but she was my director. She was a wonderful theater director, and because I was not the kid that had the gift for Yiddish, you know, I did not have an ear. You know, they talk about musicians that, you know, can't carry a tune in a bucket. You know, that's sort of me. I can't carry a tune in a, in a bucket. So she would come to our house. So we lived in the, in the San Gabriel Valley. She'd come all the way from, from uh, West Hollywood out to the San Gabriel Valley, uh, Monterey Park, and she would sit across the table from uh, me. This is the only time my mother ever cleaned the dining room table, right? <laughs> so Belle's coming, so Belle's coming, clean everything off. And she would sit there. 
across from me at the table, and she would write out with a pencil that was this big, right? She would write out the transliteration of the Yiddish, and then she would give us, give me the subtext of whatever was in the Yiddish. So she was, she was this amazing, energetic woman. And here's an example of one of the plays that we were in back in the eight, in the 1960s. So you know that that this um, it was Sibel Bender and, and Lenny Potash who sang music and taught us uh, Jewish songs, um, and uh, Sid and Ethel Weinstein of the San Gabriel Valley Kinderschule, and of course my dear parents of of blessed memory who planted in me the seeds of Yiddish culture. What was called at the time in secular Yiddish school, in the secular Yiddish schools movement, Yiddishkeit. <laughs> to see how firmly it was planted, this is a photo of Ethel Weinstein, who also passed away this year. Here, Ethel is conducting a combined chorus of Shula kids at the Wilshire Ebel Theater in the early 1960s. My sister and Robin are, and I are somewhere on the floor there with that <laughs> stage full of children and teenagers. But look at the backdrop. Whose face is peeking out there? Parrots. Parrots. Yud Lamed Parrots, or I-L Parrots, right? So here, we're children, little children, and already we're learning about I-L Parrots. So flash forward now 50 years. To my great surprise, those deeply planted scenes of Yiddishkeit suddenly blossomed forth while I was teaching a ninth grade religious school class at my local synagogue in Raleigh, North Carolina. These are just a few of the students in what I have dubbed the class from Gehenna, <laughs> the class from hell. May no shame befall them. When they weren't sleeping, they were laughing, teasing, and punching each other. I couldn't keep their attention to save my life. So one day, in desperation, I brought in this book, The Magician and Other Stories a collection of English translated Yiddish short stories that, you guessed it, I had been carrying around with me since I was a teenager in middle school. Now most of the stories in this book were written by these three writers, who we all know as the three classic writers of modern Yiddish literature. Sholem Abramovich, who used the pen name Mendele Mocher's Forum when he wrote in Yiddish, Ayel Peretz, the masterful short story author, and the humorist Sholem Aleichem, who is probably best known today for his Tevye stories, which were turned into what Broadway musical? Fiddler on the Roof. I won't sing tradition for you. <laughs> so one Sunday morning, I just came in with the book and began to read one of Ayel Peretz's stories to the class. Suddenly I realized the room had gotten very quiet. How, I wondered, could they have fallen asleep so quickly? <laughs> but when I looked up, I couldn't believe my eyes because they were wide awake. Everyone was staring back at me and they were totally engaged in the story. And when I finished, we had a very lively and civil discussion. <laughs> I tried it again a few weeks later with a story by Sholem Aleichem. Same effect. Although these stories were written over a hundred years ago, they still had the power to hold the attention of a Jewish audience, including a Jewish audience of ninth graders. Well, this experience had a profound effect on me, and realizing that I probably wasn't cut out to be a ninth grade religious school teacher, I set out to find ways to bring these writers' works to modern audiences. 
first as plays, then as monologues for storytelling, and finally as retold tales published in a little book called Souls Are Flying, a celebration of Jewish stories. And it was while I was doing research on the writers whose stories appear in this book that I began no uh, noticing another name popping up here and there, a name I had never heard of before, Jacob Dinazan. And what was so strange was the English spelling of the name kept changing. <laughs> Dinazan's name in Yiddish, uh, let's see. So, so, so this is his, his name, Dinazan's name, the spelling. In, in Yiddish, the spelling is always the same, Dinazan. But look at all the transliterations in English. It's like Hanukkah, right? You know, all the different transliterations of Hanukkah. And there's also all of these different pronunciations of the name, too. Everyone has a different pronunciation of Dinazan. So... Another thing that was fascinating was that every time Dinazan's name appeared, it was always in relationship to another author, most frequently I.L. Peretz. Here's an example from a memoir by Y.Y. Y. Trunk about his first visit to Peretz's apartment in Warsaw. Peretz led me into his study a dwarfish creature, gray-haired and gray-bearded, sat at the desk absorbed in rolling cigarettes. This is Jacob Dinazan, Parrot said, get acquainted. <coughs> Dinazan turned to inspect me. To him, I was a new face, a young man in a long black coat. As for me, it was with great awe that I looked at him. This gray, dwarfish man was the famous author of The Dark Young Man and Yusela, a book over which I had wept a sea of tears. My mother had wailed aloud over it, and even my hard-hearted grandfather had broken into sobs and groped for a cane to beat up Beryl, the cruel Malamed, the cruel Hebrew teacher. And this is from a memoir by A. Mukdoini. Older writers used to avoid parrots. Jacob Dinazan was the outstanding exception. Yet there was something poignantly tragic about the friendship between these two men. The bold facts of the case are that Dinazan's fellowship with parrots meant the end of his career as a writer. His literary aspirations now merged with or became subservient to those of Peretz. Yet before the flowering of this friendship, Dinazan had been a writer of considerable talent with an individuality all his own and an assured place in Yiddish literature. An assured place in Yiddish literature. So these were the things that I was starting to find as I started to explore this name I had never heard before. And as I delved deeper into Jewish literary history, I was astounded by Jacob Dinazan's contributions to Yiddish literature. In the second half of the 19th century, Jacob Dinazan was a very successful Yiddish novelist. His Der Schwarzer Jungermannschick, The Dark Young Man, is considered the first best-selling novel in Yiddish. It's also considered the first realistic Jewish romance. And as Miri was saying, his decision to write in Yiddish instead of Hebrew was a conscious decision, and we will hear a little later how that affected his life. And Dinazan not only had a close relationship with I.L. Peretz, let's see, there we go. 
Dina Zahn not only had a close relationship with I.L. Peretz, he also had a long and enduring friendship with Sholem Aleichem. That friendship began in 1888 when Sholem Aleichem paid a visit to Jacob Dina Zahn's small apartment in Warsaw. Sholem Aleichem was on the verge of publishing a literary anthology in Yiddish. And he came to seek Dina Zahn's business advice and to acquire a story for the first volume. Two years later, Dina Zahn sealed his friendship with I.L. Peretz when he published out of his own pocket Peretz's first book of Yiddish stories. Once the books were printed, Dina Zahn shipped them off to Peretz to help him advance his writing career. So as I started to connect the dots, I became more and more curious about this Yiddish writer named Jacob Dinazan. But when I went looking for stories by him, I couldn't find any because none of his works had ever been translated into English. Now, the story could have ended right there, right? If it hadn't been for Kathleen Southern, a friend in Raleigh who just happened to discover this book, Zakroinus und Bilder, Städtel Kinderjorn Schreibers, Memories and Scenes, Städtel Childhood Writers. And, and from the title and what I, little I could learn about it, I thought I had found Jacob Dinazan's autobiography. Perhaps I thought if I could read this book, I could finally satisfy my curiosity. So, to make a long story short, in November 2003, I purchased a copy of Zakroinus and Bilder from the uh, Yiddish Book Center in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, as you know, it's a clearinghouse of old Yiddish books. And I like to mention, when I purchased my first copy of a book from the Yiddish Book Center, I did it by telephone. This was before the internet was so uh, you know, ubiquitous, and so I called them up. They said, yes, we have this copy. How much? 850, good, send it to me. And a few days later, a, a, the book arrived uh, in, in Raleigh. Now, unfortunately, even though Sabelle was my teacher, and Lenny too, I would, didn't really do a very good job of learning Yiddish. I'm sorry, my ear wasn't that good, and my attention wasn't the best. And so anyway, so I don't speak Yiddish, I don't read Yiddish. So I had to commission a professional Yiddish translator Tina Lunson to translate the book into English. Well, we quickly discovered that Memories and Scenes was not an autobiography. In fact, it turned out to be a collection of short stories, some of which were autobiographical in nature. The collection had been published between 1928 and 1929 as part of a multi-volume set honoring Dina Zahn's 10th yard site. Although Memories and Scenes was not an autobiography, Dina Zahn's short stories were similar in content and theme to the stories of Ayel Peretz and Sholem Aleichem. But there was a difference. Dina Zahn's stories had an emotional quality they could bring a tear to your eye. I would learn later that evoking tears was a Dinazan specialty. <laughs> I can also say that Dinazan included enough personal details in his stories to fan the flames of my curiosity. So, with the encouragement of my sister Robin and her wonderful husband Jim, my brother-in-law and my longtime companion, Carolyn Tobin, not to mention a long list of wonderful Yiddish translators. You might recognize one name there, Mary Coral. And if you 
if you look on your cards that have been going around, there's the book um, uh, Jacob Dinazan Biography by Shmuel Rojansky, which uh, Miri uh, translated into English, plus lots of other materials we have on our website. So anyway, we all set out to learn everything we could about Jacob Dinazan. Here are just a few of the highlights. Jacob Dinazan was born in Nai Zeger, New Zeger, in the Kovno region of Lithuania in 1851. Here we have his name listed in a Zeger census dated 1858, Yanko Eliash Dinerzan. Look at the spelling, D-I-N-E-R-Z-U-N. This was the first time I'd ever seen it spelled this way. <laughs> And notice, it lists his age as seven. This information, which was uncovered just this year by three international members of the online user group Jewish Gen, lays to rest a dispute about Dinazan's birth year. Even though at the time of his death, Yiddish publications reported Dinazan's birth year as 1851. Most biographical entries list the year as 1856. And what's even more troubling is the mausoleum in the Jewish cemetery of Warsaw has 1858 etched into it. Look at the name in the middle. Now the reason why this means something is because Based on this age between 1851 and 1856, it gives us more clarity about how old Dinazan was when he wrote his first novel and when it was published and how successful it was when it was published. We also learn from this census that Dinazan's parents were named Benjamin and Pessy, and he had, Dinazan had three sisters. From memories and scenes, we learn that Dinazan's father traveled for business and his mother was a very pious and loving woman. We also learn that Dinazan appeared destined to be a writer from a very young age. Many years later, in a letter to the Yiddish literary historian Shmuel Niger, Dinazan offers this insight into his earliest writings. I began to write when I was barely 10 years old. Why I wrote, I don't exactly know. But for as long as I can remember, everything that would move another to cry out, to complain, or even to laugh, moved me to take pen in hand and write until my awakening heart spent itself and became peaceful. Now, around 1862 or 1863, just before his uh, 12th birthday, Dinazan's life was suddenly upended by the death of his father. His mother, now left with four mouths to feed on her own, makes the difficult decision to send her only son to live with his uncle, Isaac Eliashev, in the Russian city of Mohalev, on the Dnieper River, 400 miles away. Jacob Dinazan was now an orphan, because in those days, you were considered an orphan if you lost just one parent. And although he was going to live with a caring and generous family member, we can only imagine how being separated from his loving mother and devoted sisters affected this small, bright, and sensitive boy. We will see that the plight of orphans becomes a central theme in Dinazan's writings and will emerge again at the end of his life in his community service. Under the guidance of Uncle Eliashev, an observant Jew who also had an interest in secular subjects, Dinazan is enrolled in a yeshiva, a Jewish academy of higher education. As he grows older, he becomes aware of the Jewish enlightenment ideas that are starting to circulate among the young people of Mohalev. 
Now the journalist and critic S.L. Citron, who includes Dinazan in his memoir, Three Literary Generations, tells us that Dinazan felt a strong desire to help uplift and educate the poor and less fortunate. To this end, he volunteers to teach in a Talmud Torah, a community school for poor boys. Citron writes, they were not only teachers for the children, but acted like faithful fathers who took care of their physical and material needs and provided them with food, drink, and a proper place to sleep. Now, at about this time, Dinazan is invited to become a tutor in the home of one of the wealthiest Jewish merchants in Mohalev, Menachem Yeshua Hurovich. Citron suggests that Hurovich's wife, Badana, had heard very good things about Jacob Dinazan. And in need of a Hebrew teacher for her children, she offers Jacob Dinazan a job as a live-in tutor. And what a job it must have been. Because the Jewish young people in Mohalev, for the Jewish young people in Mohalev, the Hurovich's household was at the center of the city's social and cultural scene. Madonna had five sons and one daughter, and it was in the Hurovich's house that they and their friends gathered together to discuss literature, politics, and social issues. Some of the participants were struggling with difficult personal problems, problems Dinazan would later weave into his novels. Before long, Dinazan's intelligence, wise counsel, and gentle demeanor so endear him to the Hurovich family the, that Menachem Yeshua promotes him to bookkeeper and ultimately to manager of the family business. But alas, a dark cloud appears over Dinazan's bright horizon. According to Citron, Dinazan falls in love with the Hurovich's daughter. Now, it must be said, Citron is the only one who relates this story. There's no way to verify it. Dinazan never talked about it, and biographers who refer, refer to it, like me, are dependent on Citron's veracity. He doesn't always get the facts right in his memoir. But if it's true, it gives us some important insights into Dinazan's later life and the content of his literary works, including his most famous a novel, The Dark Young Man. Because according to Citron, even though Jacob Dinazan fell madly in love with his student, he never said a word to her or her parents. Whether this was due to his shyness, his lack of confidence, or his integrity and strict moral code as a teacher, he never declared his love to the young woman or to her family. And to add insult to injury, when the Hurovich's daughter was finally of marriageable age, the family assigned Dinazan the task of traveling to Vilna to arrange her marriage to another man. <laughs> Here's how Citron ends his chapter. When Dinazan returned from Vilna, he became ill and did not leave his bed for three weeks. The city of Vilna, called the Jerusalem of Lithuania, plays an important role in Dinazan's early career as a writer. It's in Vilna, on Hurovich's family, for Hurovich family business, that Dinazan meets Badana's sister, Dvora Ram. Dvora Ram, in partnership with her brothers-in-law, owns a major Jewish publishing company called The Widow and Brothers Ram. 
And through this connection, Dinazan is introduced to one of Vilna's leading Yiddish authors, Isaac Mayer Dick. Dick takes Dinazan under his wing, and at some point, Dinazan shares two of his Yiddish manuscripts with the elder author. <clears throat> Dick is very impressed with Dinazan's writing, and he recommends one of the manuscripts to the Rom Publishing Company. But it's not the dark young man. Dinazan explains this in, a, in his letter to Shmuel Niger. The first work I wrote with publication in mind carried the name for the sins of the fathers or a mirror for Jewish women, shopkeepers, and tavern keepers. The publisher's widow and brother's rom only bought fathers from me. They accepted the dark young man simply as a supplement to fathers, but not for publication. The Ram publishing manager tells Dinazan that he will keep the manuscript of the dark young man in the printer's vault until, perhaps, in some future happy hour, it will be rediscovered and found worthy of being published. <laughs> Ram pays Dinazan 23 rubles and moves forward with the sins of the fathers, a tragic tale about a sensitive young woman who is forced into an arranged marriage with a coarse and despicable man. Although deeply distressed, the young woman, instead of running off to escape the situation as her friends suggest, gives in to her parents and marries the scoundrel. The hope, she tells her friends, is that she can educate and reform him. You have ever heard that before? <laughs> but of course, in the end, you know, the marriage becomes untenable and the young woman takes her own life. Boy. A story very much in keeping with the real life conflicts that Dinazan was hearing about in Moalev. In fact, that becomes the problem for the novel. Because when the Rom Publishing Company submits the manuscript to the Rush, Russian censor, he rejects it. Some believe the censor knew the family in Moalev on which the story was based, and in order to protect the family's good name, refused to authorize the book's publication. The manuscript was confiscated and lost forever. I think I'm a little off. Okay. So, of course, Rom, in order not to lose their investment of 23 rubles, pulls the manuscript of the dark young man out of the vault and shows it to the censor. This story is approved, and the novel is published in the fall of 1877. The title, as you see, is in two parts Hebrew and Yiddish. Ha-ni yavim, di ha-ni imim, oder der schwarzer junger manche, the beloved and pleasing, or the dark young man. And to everyone's surprise, including the author himself, the book becomes a runaway bestseller. The first 10,000 copies sell out quickly and several additional printings follow. Now, why was this book so popular? First, it was a love story. Two innocent lovers being threatened by a despicable villain. Second, it was contemporary. It wasn't based on a Bible story, fable, or legend. Dinazan's main characters are modern Jews living in a modern city in the Russian Empire in the mid-1840s. They are struggling with real-life issues and coping with real-life challenges. One of them is arranged marriages, and we'll share just a piece of Dinazan's writings about arranged marriages a little later. And there is something more. 
Tinazon has an uncanny ability to tap the Jewish heart, and by so doing, elicits copious tears from his readers. From early in his career as a writer, Dinazan understood the power of tears to console the Jewish heart. In every place and in all times he writes in memories and scenes, the Jewish heart is filled with troubles. One just needs to know the right word or touching melody and the thick ice that forms around the Jewish heart by cold life breaks open and tears pour out. And out they poured. The Yiddish editor Nachman Meisel writes, there was hardly a Jewish home where all the members of the family, old and young, male and female, had not read the novel and shed hot tears of sympathy for the sufferings of the unfortunate Yosef, Rosa, and Ruhama, while the name of the evil young man, Mesha Schneer, became the byword for hypocrisy, cruelty, and murder. Now, with the huge success of the dark young man, one would think that Dinazan was well on his way to stardom. He even had another novel waiting in the wings. But then, out of the blue, he pulls the plug on his own success. Years later, he explains his reasons to Shmuel Niger. I believe you have more or less the idea concerning the success of the dark young man. It was almost that same year I finished my novel, A Stumbling Stone in the Road. However, I had no desire to publish it due to the dead silence of the collective Hebrew language press regarding the dark young man. Despite the fact that tens of thousands of copies were sold and there was almost no Jewish household in which it had not been read. The Hebrew press that Dinazan refers to is the Jewish Enlightenment press and those editors and publishers who he so wanted to impress. Unfortunately, they completely ignored the, Jew, the dark young man because it was written in Yiddish. And Yiddish was frowned on by the intellectuals as the mama lotion, the mother tongue, the language of the home and the marketplace, the poor and less educated, the Jewish folk. On top of that, Jewish writers seeing the popularity of Dinazan's Yiddish novel, to paraphrase Mendel and Mochter's forum, followed each other head over heels, one after another into the book writing business. Numerous authors jumped onto the bandwagon and began churning out imitative works of inferior quality. Dinazan writes, I felt guilty for the whole flood of vapid and dismal novels drowning the Jewish reader. I couldn't stop writing, but it didn't cost me effort or mental strain not to publish the finished works. Dinazan will not publish another major literary work for 13 years. The next Six or seven years of Dinazan's life are hard to track, but by 1885, he's moved to Warsaw, where he takes a small attic apartment in the home of his older sister, Fega Kat, and her family. Dinazan's small apartment becomes a, a, a gathering place for, um, uh, for Jewish writers, for the Jewish community, and What's so interesting about this tiny little apartment that he had was that it only had a bed. There wasn't even enough room for chairs. So everybody sat on the bed when they came to visit Jacob Dinazan and talk about literature. In 1889, with the strong encouragement of I.L. Peretz, uh, Dinazan ends his 13-year Let's make sure. Yes, his, ends his 13-year hiatus and publishes at his own expense 
the novel Evan Negev, or the Rashtain in Beg, stumbling block or a stone in the road. Two years later, Dinazan contri contributes his newest novel, Hershala, to the first volume of Di Yiddish Bibliotech, the Jewish uh, Library, a Yiddish anthology he publishes in partnership with Paris. Like the dark young man, this is an emotional and bittersweet romance, but the characters are more three-dimensional and the story less heavy-handed. The novel is often praised as one of Dinazan's best. In 1899, Dinazan's short novel, Yasala, a story from Jewish life, is published. This heart-rending tale describes the sad, poverty-stricken, violent life of a bright and gentle schoolboy whose treatment at the hands of his teacher, parents, and rich society is both shocking and painful. You remember that Trunk mentions how powerful this book was to, to everyone in his family. Even though it possesses the same tear-inducing poignancy of his earlier novels, one also feels the sword of the social reformer in Dinazan's indictment of traditional Jewish elementary school education. With Yosela, Dinazan firmly establishes himself as a defender and protector of Jewish children. Dinazan will continue to write several novels up until about 1905, first publishing them in various Yiddish newspapers and journals before releasing them in book form. You can see just some of the books that still have not been translated into English, but that are very wonderful novels by Dinazan. At the same time, Dinazan is also playing an increasingly important role in Warsaw's Jewish literary community, although I.L. Peretz gets most of the credit for advancing modern Yiddish literature in Poland at the turn of the 20th century. And Dinazan would not have disputed this. In 1901, Dinazan uh, heads up a, um, a celebration for Peretz's 25th Jubilee, his writing Jubilee, which coincided with Peretz's 50th birthday. And um, Dinazan presented Peretz with two gold stamped volumes. One was a collection of all of his Yiddish stories up to that point, which Dinazan had collected, painstakingly gone through newspapers and publications and other publications and journals and and uh, assembled them. And at the at the uh, in the second volume was just blank pages except for a, a little um, tribute that Dinazan had written with this inscription, write and write from this jubilee to your next jubilee, for yourself and for us. Amen. Eight years later, Dinazan would come up with a completely different gift for Sholem Aleichem for his 25th jubilee, a gift that would prove much more practical and lucrative. The celebration was held in Warsaw in 1909, but unfortunately, Sholem Aleichem had been ill and was recovering in Italy. So his wife, Olga, attended in his place. When she returned to her husband, she was bearing gifts. A special blend of tea, some fine writing paper, and most importantly, copyrights. Dinazan had spearheaded a committee to buy back Sholem Aleichem's copyrights from the original publishers. This gave Sholem Aleichem the ability to republish and earn income from his prior literary works. In gratitude, Sholem Aleichem sent this thank you note dated March 27th, 1909. Beloved, good, and dear Jacob Dinazan, do you recognize this paper? It's yours. Not that there isn't any writing paper in Italy, but it isn't like Dinazan's paper. 
Why, there is tea there too, here too. You can get anything for money. Inazan's tea, however, has a taste all its own. We drank Dinazan's tea yesterday with all the children seated around the table. Little Tamara was there too. She doesn't know Uncle Dinazan yet, but she will soon learn that there is somewhere in the city of Warsaw a tiny, spare, graying little man with tiny but spotlessly clean little hands with a little graying beard that once was reddish and with kindly eyes forever smiling even when moist with tears. He smokes little cigarettes rolled with his own little fingers. He drinks his own tea made in his own little teapot. And he always sits on the same chair at the table where he keeps hidden in an unusually well-organized fashion, other people's secrets, other people's troubles, and other people's anguish, which he holds so close to his uncommonly big heart. And this good uncle is called Uncle Dinazan. Isn't that beautiful? From Shalom Aleichem. There was a, a reviewer uh, in the uh, Jewish Daily Forward who said, um, if, uh, Shal if uh, Dinazan hadn't really existed, Shalom Aleichem probably would create, have created him. <laughs> <clears throat> the final five years of Jacob Dinazan's <laughs> life are a whirlwind of disruption and difficulty. And this is a fascinating transition that a person makes in their later years. Uh, so it, there's a great deal of relevance for many of us uh, in the final five years of Dinazan's life. Although he remains engaged with the Yiddish literary community, even serving, as we see here on the board of the Yiddish Writers and Journalists Association, the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 forces him into a completely new career, community benefactor. As battles rage on the border between Germany and Russia, Jewish refugees pour into Warsaw, among them orphans and children separated from their parents. Collaborating with I.O. Peretz, Dinazan throws himself into the establishment of an into the establishment of an orphanage and school. Day and night he works tirelessly to raise funds to feed, clothe, and care for the war-ravaged children. You can barely make him out in the upper right-hand corner of this photograph. Then, in 1915, tragedy strikes close to home when Peretz dies of a fatal heart attack during the Passover holiday. As mourners stream through Peretz's apartment, Dinazan sits beside his friend, never leaving the body for a moment. Nearly all of Jewish Warsaw joins the procession that carries Peretz's casket to the cemetery on Okapova Street. According to one Yiddish newspaper, in some places, the crowd reaches up to 150,000. Dinazan pours out his grief to the renowned author, playwright, and ethnographer, Esonsky. Dearest, most beloved, and after our blessed parents, my one and only remaining friend, I'm ashamed that I continue to live. My life would truly be a disgrace if I were as bad as all the others who believe as they do that parrots, both of ours and especially my parrots, really died. When I stand before his grave, he is alive at my side and reads along with me the little temporary grave marker. And as a hot tear seeps from my eye, he notices it right away 
and with his reassuring smile laughs at me for having a woman's tendency to weep so easily. Lou, why are you crying, he asks. What do these words on the grave marker tell you? Silly man, they were written by your grave digger who doesn't know anything about life and death. For him, perhaps, Isaac Laybush Parrots has died. For you, however, he is still alive. In May of 1916, more bad news. Warsaw's Yiddish newspaper, Heint, reports that Sholem Aleichem has died in New York City. A year later, Sholem Abramovich passes away in Odessa, Yet Dinazan persists, throwing himself ever deeper into his work for children and the secular Jewish schools movement. Look carefully, and you will see Jacob Dinazan sitting in the midst of this precious class of very young girls. I only wish I had a photograph to depict these words by the educator and author C.S. Kasdan. He often played with the children, entering their circle, taking them by the hand and dancing with them. He remembered the child that was sad the day before. And if today the child was lively again, it was for him truly a celebration. In the summer of 1919, Dinazan's health began to deteriorate, and by the afternoon of August 29th, it was clear that he had very little time remaining. A reporter for the Height described the scene at Dinazan's bedside. At three o'clock, the patient was resting comfortably, but by the, his difficult breathing, it was clear that the last moments were coming. The friends and admirers who had come to visit did not leave, but stayed by his bed. At 15 minutes after five, the patient gave a slight shudder and stopped breathing. His eyes closed and his face softened and became peaceful. Five minutes later, Dinazan exhaled his last breath. Because Dinazan died on Shabbos, the Sabbath, the Jewish newspapers did not publish the news until Sunday, August 31st, the day of the funeral. So the news of Dinazan's death was spread by word of mouth. When the Heint did appear on Sunday, it reported on the funeral procession that started at the home of the deceased at Karmelitska 29, and ended with Dinazan's burial in the Jewish cemetery on Okopova Street. Dinazan's final wish was granted, and he was buried beside his friend, Ayo Peres. The author and critic David Frischman described the day. The funeral was underway. 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 people, who knows how many. The streets were overflowing with delegations and organizations from every affiliation and faction, almost the entire Jewish population of Warsaw. Rain beat down on our heads from a dreary sky, and I was the only one walking close beside the wagon through the mud. Oh, poor, quiet man. In your quietude, you did not know that the world was so shrill and making of tumult that it would also make a tumult of the funeral of such a quiet man. And something else you did not know, that a time would come when a man did not go to the Eastern Wall, but that the Eastern Wall came to him. Later that afternoon, at the gravesite, Essonsky spoke these words. A great and beautiful poem 
has ended. The heart has stopped that lived with the people that rejoiced in its joys and suffered with its frequent troubles. For 68 years he spun out his pure life like a sacrifice, like a saint, a romantic and an idealist in his writing and in his life. He was exactly the same. He was always with those who suffered, for whom things were going badly and needed help. He gave away everything to them. He was not concerned about himself. Whenever you saw a smile on his face, it was not about something done for him, but because he had given something to someone else. 100 years after Ronsky spoke these words, my family and I had the opportunity to participate in a Yorkzeit service in the Jewish cemetery of Warsaw, where Dinazan is buried in a grand mausoleum with his friends I.O. Peretz and Esonsky. For me, this was the culmination of our efforts to help restore Jacob Dinazan to his rightful place in modern Yiddish literature. It's been an inspiring and humbling journey to get to know this man through his own words and through the words of his friends and his critics, to see his photographs alone and with others, and to reflect on his ideas, his values, his heart. We see Dinazan's heart in his novels and his stories. From his earliest days, he knew that Jews sometimes need to shed tears to soften and console our full and troubled hearts. I, I love this quote from the author and photographer Alter Katsizny, who was at Dinazan's bedside and must have been very close to Dinazan at the end of his life. Katsizny writes, this frail Dinazan, the soft-hearted one with a feminine soul, earned the true, the most consistent folk credit. He was the true writer of the people. It was not society that read him, but the folk, pious mothers, dreamy daughters, bearded fathers, entire families read him. Two authentic folk writers were ours, Dinazan and Sholem Aleichem. It does not occur to anyone to put these two writers on the same level, yet it is so. Dinazan is the tearful one, and Sholem Aleichem is the clown. You will cry as naturally reading Dinazan as you will burst into laughter with Sholem Aleichem. But in the final analysis, as I reflect back over the past 18 years, what stands out to me is Jacob Dinazan's character, his integrity and honor, his modesty and compassion, his courage and unfailing loyalty to his friends and the Jewish people, all the qualities we think of when we call a person, what, a mensch. In his life and in his writings, Jacob Dinazan was the embodiment of a mensch, a role model during his lifetime and a role model for us today. It's what kept drawing me back to his works and his ideas and his life. That's why it's so important to remember there was a Jacob Dinazan in the world. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time to do a few readings, or are we pretty probably pretty close to the end of time? It's just one long paragraph. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's. One long paragraph. But it's very long. It's from the dark young man, Miriam.
you know, when they wrote in Yiddish, this is actually something that I um, found out from uh, one of the translators, is that, you know, because the trans, because Yiddish writing was a, based on the oral language, mm -hmm. they would write, <laughs> they would write like they were talking, you know? And you had, you had, if you knew the language, you knew where the commas went, you knew where the pauses were, you knew how to take a, where to take a breath. But when you're translated it into English, it's one long run-on sentence, you know, that goes on for pages. So anyway, um, this is um, I, I, this is the one thing. We'll just do this. The um, Dinazan has a has a whole take that's very different from Fiddler on the Roof about marriage brokers and arranged marriages. Okay, and so we're going to do uh, just a, a brief uh, piece, uh, and Miri will do it in Yiddish. And I will do it in English. And this is where the matchmakers are coming to arrange a, a match for um, uh, for uh, one of the daughters in The Dark Young Man in Der Schwarze Wintermantel. Do you want to do that first? This is pretty brutal, by the way. So let's see if you can follow it. That's the Yiddish. So this is called, the chapter is called Golden. <coughs> It's called Golde. Im Fetmannstuh haben sie herumgeholfen zu schicken Schatronen von allen Seiten. Die so ledige Menschen was handeln mit dem Glück von Gold umschuldige. Sie unbekannte Kinder, also ihnen pflegt einmal handeln mit Sklaven. A Reus werden gebundene, geschmiede in eisene Hand und fies auf den Mark. Und jeder grobe, wilder Seuche fleht sie ausprobieren, sie a Schmitztorn, a Treibtorn, die Pferd. Die Schatronen bringen euch die Sachen. Und Käufer, sie regieren a Kucktorn, die Kalle, Proven den Rossen. Sehr wertel is, a Kalle is a Hunter. Oder jede Kalle hat tausend Chassonen und jede Rossen hat tausend Kalles. Und jede Rossen, jede Kalle sind in Mechoyev noch sehr leuchter, sich auszuputzen, veredlichen, was der Schatten bringt. Und was kommt sie sehen und beweisen sehr Würde, sehr Schönheit, Herz und Gefühl, als Arois offen. Und wer wohl in der Welt hat also jeden mit der Ohren und unglücklich gemacht, wie der Sort äh, Zertrieger, der Sort Sklavenhändler, welche man ruft sie an in unser Loschen Schatronen. Für ein Rubel sind sie belohnen zwei unschuldige Kinder. Was haben sie in ihrem Leben nicht gehört und nicht gesehen? Sie um glücklich zu machen und vergiften sie Leben diesen Grub in heimlichen Zeiten, was der Sklavenhandel hat schon jemand aufgehört in Europa und was mit Scheude hören mir erzählen, was es tut sich noch mit sie in Afrika. Bemerken mir gar nicht, als die eigene Mischbuche Sklavenhändler jene äh, sind noch da bei uns in rechten Mitten Europa. Und mehr wie Uh, mehr wie um Tun, bei uns jeden, der ganze Unterscheid ist, ist nur, was, was, jene, uh, was jene fangen Menschen mit in der Heim und tun sie an, die Ketten, Eder, sie führen sie auf den Markt und die, und die unsere niedrigst, niedrigste Schlafenhändler fangen sie in Stub, verkaufen sie früher, 
heben sie allein die Ketten in Hand und schließen sie ein, als das ist ein golden Finger. Sie tun das an und geben a Kuck, als das ist verkauft, schwer in Ketten eingeschnitt und es ist schön verfahren. Und man, und man berecht gar nicht, als man verkauft zwei Klei, zwei blühende Kinder, zwei ganze Lebens für ein ganz kleinen Paradies. Well, it's pretty amazing to hear it in Yiddish. Huh? So this is a slightly edited from that and now in English. Matchmakers began pouring into Friedman's house from every side. Insensitive people trading in the happiness of innocent and unsuspecting children, the way men once traded in slaves by dragging them to the marketplace bound in iron shackles, where buyers tried them out by whipping them like horses. But instead of doing business in the marketplace, These matchmakers bring their buyers to the homes of brides and grooms. Their slogan, a bride is like a hand towel. There are a thousand grooms for every bride and a thousand brides for every groom. Potential brides and grooms are obligated to dress up in their finest clothes and display their hearts and souls to every prospect who is brought to examine them. Who in the world has made so many Jews unhappy as that deceiver, that slave trader, known in our language as the matchmaker? <laughs> For a ruble, they take an interest in two innocent children who have never seen or heard of each other, and by so doing, poison their young lives and make them miserable to their dying day. <laughs> so, Dinazan didn't pull any punches, yeah. did? And think about this, he's writing this, he's maybe 22, 23, you know, and he's talking about what's going on at that time, 1877, so it would have been before 1877, because the book is published in 1877. And it's, it's quite startling, and it was quite startling, I'm sure, for the readers at that time, but it resonated, especially with the young people. And what makes this book so interesting, The Dark Young Man, is that Dinazan also presents the parent's point of view. We hear Golda, the mother, talk about her childhood and how she wants something better for her daughters. And we hear the father talk about, you know, what are the expectations of a father you know, in terms of their daughters, and in terms of the men, you know, we saw, we see that conflict in Tevye, you know, Tevye has to deal with that conflict, but uh, Dinazan has, uh, it doesn't have, you know, Tevye to tell, he doesn't tell it with humor, he tells it in a very, very uh, dramatic way, so, um, listen, I think this has been incredible, maybe, maybe we'll take a few questions, if anybody has any, along the way. Yes. So it it appears in a book called Sh the, the Der, Der Shalom Das Shalom Aleichem book, uh, which was edited by his um, uh, son-in-law uh, Berkowitz, I I B Berkowitz, I think, and so uh, at, but it but I found it initially in uh, a book called The Sholem Aleichem Panorama, which was published out of Canada, um, and uh, I, that's where I first found it. So, but the, the Yiddish is there. Um, interesting story really quickly about Sholem Aleichem and Dinazan. So Sholem Aleichem had the exact same situation that Dinazan had. He was brought into a rich family uh, to tutor the, the children. One of them was a young woman who, who Shalom Aleichem fell in love with, right? Well, when the father finds out, what does he do? He throws Shalom Aleichem out. Get out of this house, right? And Shalom Aleichem leaves. Well, what happens? The daughter, <laughs> Olga, runs after him. 
they get married, they elope, they get married, and ultimately they're able to reconcile with the father-in-law. And actually, when, when, when Sholem Aleichem's father-in-law passed away because of Russian law, Sholem Aleichem got to control the fortune, you know, got to control his, his father-in-law's uh, fortune, his, his, his wife's inheritance. And uh, the mother, the mother also put her, her, uh, her, her funds in uh, Sholem Aleichem's capable hands, right? And what does he do? He loses it all in a Russian stock market crash, a Kiev, Kiev stock market crash, and, and for the rest of his life is sort of living in, just on the edge of poverty. Um, but the, sort of an interesting thing when I think about this, so, so, so Sholem Aleichem elopes with the daughter and there's a happy ending, right? It, so it sounds like a Sholem Aleichem story. And Dinazan, he doesn't say a word and he doesn't get the girl and of course he has a sad, tearful ending. And so it just seems like it's appropriate for each one of the characters. So, yes, sir. You know much about the financial aspects of being a writer and a bookseller. I read that one of his books, maybe the first one, sold 200,000 copies, which seems like an extraordinarily large number. Did the author get 23 rubles? 23 rubles. That, that was the whole idea. You know, the publisher bought the novel, got the rights to the novel. And so he did not, it wasn't like we know today with royalties and things like that. So the publisher owned the rights to that. And, uh, and this was 200,000 perhaps in the course of his lifetime. But still, when you think this was a Yiddish book, um, uh, only read by uh, Jewish people, um, uh, that, that's an astounding number. I wish his, I wish his English translation sold like that. <laughs> Unfortunately, they haven't. <laughs> yes. Yes. You had uh, photos of some title pages of some of the Yiddish books. Yes. And of course they were all written in Yiddish, but go back more. Go, go back uh, uh, to, to an earlier one. Uh, um, oh, hang on. It's so great, this technology. Yeah, yeah it's way in the front. Um, Notice. At the bottom, in English, it says printed in Poland. Why is that? Or how is that? You know, um, you know, it's very possible that this book was actually distributed in the United States. You know, a lot of these books were distributed in the United States. And one of the books, one of the books, one of the stories that Miri translated was uh, called... Um, um, Shim, shim, uh, shim, sa Samson, shim? Yeah. It's a lady. Yeah. Um, but it was, this, it was a book. What, do you remember the title? But anyway, it was a book that was originally um, uh, written in Russia, and it was an allegory about the czar. And the censor forbid it from being public, published. So <laughs> they sent the manuscript over here, and it was published in America. And so that's why we have a Yiddish copy of it. So yeah, so that's possible. I, I, I do want to get to the end. I do want to make sure that everybody sees this um, uh, website address. Um, and you all have the cards, and uh, but um, oh, uh, well, this is the Jewish Storyteller Press uh, website. But anyway. At any rate, you can find out information, and you can also get to the Jacob Dinazan website, which is jacobdinazan.com. Uh, and everything that we've acquired, we've had translated, all of that material has all been put online. There is a, you can read Miri's translation of Rojansky's biography online, because our purpose was to try to share as much of this material as we possibly could with people who might want to continue the effort to find out more about Jacob Dinazan. So um, on the jacobdinazan.com website, there's all, there are all of the uh, newspaper reports of his death and his funeral and the eulogies and there are all kinds of other things. So if you're interested, and all of the photographs are there as well. Yes. I assume that he never got to America himself. 
No, but that's a great story. Um, he, he was, so Shalom Aleichem came to America in 1905, was invited over to come and to present his plays and to do talks and to uh, be involved in America. Shortly after that, there was a failed Russian revolution, right? And the, the, uh, the, the Russian army came in, in, in to Warsaw and closed down Warsaw. At the same time, an editor of a, Jew, of a Yiddish newspaper had sent a telegram to Jacob Dinazan, come to America, we'll pay your way, we'll give you a first class steamership Is that ticket. Huh? Eitan? Uh, no, it was um, Palin. It was um, Johann Palin. And um, Paley, Johann Paley. And Dinazan writes back and he says, I can't, you, you, and the way we know this is the letter he sent to Paley gets published in a Washington, D.C. translation in a Washington, D.C. newspaper, the Evening Star. And Dinazan says, I can't leave my people. We're under siege by the Russians in Warsaw. And Peretz was almost shot. And we are not going to hide under our beds or in our attics. We are going to walk the streets. And so I can't, I can't do it. So he never came to America. But he was offered that, which I think, again, shows how important he was as a writer. Yeah, great question. Thank you all very, very much. I really appreciate this opportunity. I think this is an example of a real mensch. Yeah. Yeah. I and mean, look at what he's brought for all of us. And, and Robin and Jim as well, really, all of you are amazing, amazing mention. Thank you.